Our speaker is from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He is a professional athlete, an entrepreneur, an author, and a passionate advocate for mental health. He played basketball for Iowa State from 2011 to 2012. As a Cyclone, he led his team in all major statistical categories, including scoring, rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks. He was drafted in the first round of the 2012 NBA draft to the Houston Rockets. As a teen, our speaker was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder. After he was drafted to the NBA, he quickly became an important voice for mental health reform in the league. He has spoken out against the lack of mental health policies for NBA players, as well as in all sports and against stigma in our society overall. As a result of his advocacy, he is one of the people credited for the forward movement the league has made in regards to mental health, including the hire of its first mental health director in 2018. Since his departure from the NBA, he has played professionally in Canada in the Big Three Professional Basketball League and has since made the tr transition from basketball to MMA. He's written two books and has starred in the video series I Flew Here. He's also founding companies including Anxious Minds Inc., Retrieving Inc., and Wing Inc. Through it all, he continues to be an outspoken advocate for mental health and against the stigma that surrounds it. Please help me in welcoming to Green Town, Roy Spite. speak. Thank you guys for being here. Um, there's a lot of places that you could be on this fine Tuesday night. Uh, um, I know the cold's, cold's on its way in, so maybe this is a, a nice uh, shift, a nice, nice event to be able to have this evening. Um, I was in Des Moines speaking yesterday, and uh, it's always good to get back to Iowa. Uh, as I've gotten away from Iowa State now, and as I was just telling one of our local reporters here, it's, it's kind of ironic that small town Iowa was pretty much the genesis of this entire modern mental health movement. So, round of applause for your, yourselves as Iowa. <laughs> the forefront of that movement. Um, yeah, so, as the introduction said, <coughs> Iowa State fans in here, hands up. Of course. <laughs> oh my God. So, we're family and friends in here. <laughs> Guys, you guys already know me then. Um, so you know my story. I was stayed. Uh, many of you know if I go back further. Well, first of all, um, the most important thing to me as I've been out here speaking about mental health more and more is that we have a very, very honest and a very, very um, accurate and progressive conversation about what mental health is. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do questions, and then we're going to have a discussion. The community discussion portion is always my favorite of these events that Jeff here has helped me set up. Jeff, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, so this this is my favorite version because we can we can go 100% raw in these these but this this session. Um, but before that, uh, yeah, 16 years old, first panic attack, smoking marijuana. I'm going to speed you through this version now because some of you may have already known this, some of you may have already heard this. Uh, smoked marijuana, had my first panic attack, had panic attacks for three months following that. Um, one would happen at the same time every day. The other two would happen at different times of the day. When I woke up, I would have panic or fear, worry about when I would have a panic attack during the day. Uh, that night when I smoked marijuana, I chose to drink alcohol too. That was a rookie move. Uh, for the first time, and I also ate macaroni and cheese beforehand. There's another rookie movie. Uh, projectile vomit, you know, the whole nine. Out of body experience, out of body experience, was watching myself move around that night as I feared for my life, was scared I was going to die. Grandfather came to pick me up from a friend's house, went home, not really knowing what had happened, not really knowing what the panic attacks were for three months until I walked into my school nurse's office one day and we happened to have a doctor on site on campus that was able to diagnose me with, with generalized anxiety disorder. And from there I was put on medication and you know put on the path to knowing about this, this issue. Uh, so 
that was kind of the, the, the backstory of, of me being introduced to anxiety and panic attacks and, and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> the NBA story, let's just get to that. Because I want to get to the discussion part. Because how, how, how long do we have? 7.30. 7.30. Oh, so we got a little bit of time. But the question discussion portion, as we've been seeing all day, is just, I'm just... How tall are you? <laughs> that is, That's I'm a question just, for the I'm day. just philosophizing my way through, through like half hour sessions like, like nobody's business. So um, I, I really want to hear what you guys have to say, what you, your questions are, because this mental health conversation is about you. It's about me, but not me. It's me, as in who am I? And, and then what does that mean for, for my life and the world and people around me? So um, speed through the NBA portion. Many of you may know, or if you take the time to Google me or did um, prior to coming here, I fought the NBA on mental health policy. When I was drafted to the NBA, they didn't have a mental health policy at all. They had a collective bargaining agreement that would stretch from that door to that door on paper. And mental health wasn't mentioned in the entire thing. So that was a problem because I had a mental health condition, number one. And so ways that that had become a problem, for example, was the, the question of whether or not I could drive the games. I don't know if many of you know about professional sports travel, but it wasn't so long ago that they only traveled the games by bus. So a while back, uh, the, the NBA never took planes. That was probably a good while back now, but um, still that was, that was a, a thing at one point. So uh, I asked to be able to drive the games because a lot of my anxiety had come from travel. When I was 16 and I started having these panic attacks, I was going around the country for my high school basketball. And so because I didn't know what the panic attacks were, oftentimes I would think that when I left Minnesota to go to Virginia or Florida or New York or Vegas or California, that I'd never come home because I was pretty sure I was having a heart attack. Well, what I developed from that was this kind of PTSD around traveling. So fast forward to me being drafted, I requested that I be able to drive when it was possible. So like, you know, from Minnesota to Chicago, Minneapolis to Chicago, Chicago to Indiana, Indiana to Cleveland. When you really take a look at the NBA map of where these teams are, it's all regional based anyway. So they're all really like a, a four or five hour drive from each other. Partially because back in the day they used to drive to the games. NBA had a big problem with that. They had a big problem with that. Um, so much so that uh, they threatened me uh, and said that my driving the games would be considered a salary cap infringement. Now, most of you adults know what a salary cap is. The young people in here who don't know what a salary cap is, uh, it's the amount of money that a team could pay a player and then how much they can spend on the collective total of the player's salaries in a given season. Okay, so salary cap infringement. Okay, so I said F you to that. Uh, and they gave me an F you back and, and we were locking horns about that situation. The reason I tell you that story is because this was only six years ago. Okay. So mental health was not seen as a, as a clear-cut medical issue just six short years ago. I know years start to pass by like faster than they ever have now with everything that we, we have going on and everything we have to distract our time. Uh, but six years is nothing. It's nothing. Um, and six years ago, this, this issue wasn't even considered a, a valid, legitimate medical issue. And so I fought them on that, and I paid a price for fighting them on that. Part of that price was that you don't see me on an NBA team now. Um, that was an okay price to pay because as we'll talk about later, probably through some of your questions and, and things like that, self-sacrifice and honesty and patience, things of that, those, those virtues, those philosophies actually did help me in my mental health. Those things are the answer to mental health. Not so much the conversation about anxiety, depression, PTSD, OCD, which I know many of you are here to talk about. And we can talk about that for sure, we will. Um, but what I'm here to tell you and stress to you is that the mental health conversation 
needs to not be about diagnosis. It needs to not be about these new um, buzzwords that you're going to hear in the media, on the news, on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, in your communities even. Um, those, those are the easy terms. Those are the, those are the easy things to get hooked onto. The mental health conversation is about you. It's about how you think. It's about how you feel. It's about how you interact with people. So that's everybody in here. Everybody, everybody in here think, feel, or interact, right? Good. Okay, good. I asked that question earlier. One of the seventh graders was not in agreement. <laughs> I asked if they thought, and their their hand didn't go up. We had to get it out of, of that one. Came around. Came around. Um, so yeah, so that's the template that I would that I would give you going forward about mental health, and we we all know about the stigmas. Um, they're so silly. I mean, I, I could get up here and go on for hours about how people didn't think that I, you know, could do this or could do that, or, you know, the, the fans would say, oh, you're, you know, you're scared or you're, you're scared to fly or you have anxiety that makes you weak or, you know, an NBA owner asking me why would I tell people that I have anxiety that I was giving up my, my weaknesses and you know, all of these kinds of things. We all know. We all know the stigmas. Um, and we should all know that they're pretty silly. Mental health is real, no doubt about it. That, that the jury is settled, the science is settled on that. Mental health is real. It's just as real as any other, as anything else in your life. Now, we can have a real deep philosophical debate about what is real and what isn't. <laughs> but we'd be here until next week, next Tuesday. Uh, mental health is, is just as real as anything else, and it's certainly as real as any of these other medical conditions. And the consequences of them are, are being more and more, are becoming more and more obvious every day. So, mental health is real. You're not weak if you have some mental health struggles, because we all have mental health struggles. And all we have to do is widen our lens of what a mental health struggle is in order to figure that out. So, show of hands, how many of us have heard of anxiety, depression, PTSD, OCD, bipolar, schizophrenia, everybody, right? Hands up, right? All of us, okay. Great. I have a therapist myself, <clears throat> and uh, the other day I was in his office and we were talking about this conversation. Because I was having my own anxieties about, personally, about how to, how to talk about these, this topic. From his perspective, my 35 years in the profession. And I told him, I said, I'm not comfortable with how much people are trying to emphasize these terms. And he's like, well, why not? I said, and I, Jeff has heard me say this before. This is a, an anxiety that was brewing in me personally before this, this session. It had been, it'd been growing. It took me a while to be able to voice it to him and really ask his opinion. Because when you go to a therapist, more of the, the dynamic is supposed to be you talking about your issues with him and your personal issues. And this is the first time I kind of brought my professional you know, issues into the, the conversation. Just so happens that this happens to be his field of expertise. So, good. Um, he said to me clearly, which is what I had always felt in my heart, but was needing his, you know, affirmation. It's like uh, diagnosis is for insurance companies. That was the first time I heard that. Jeff's never heard me say that. Uh, I, I was already under the belief that, that diagnosis was, was for clinicians and, and researchers, academic researchers. This is the first time he had said that, that I had heard somebody say that the, the diagnosis were for insurance companies. And I was like, ah. number one, I'm adding that to my speech, but number two, that might be the most important thing that, I, that somebody has told me about this issue because what it tells me is that there's a money angle. There is a money angle, not only around the mental health topic, but around the, the language that we use in the conversation. And so it seems to me like there, that that's a clear reason why you continue to hear more and more about anxiety, more and more about depression, more and more about OCD and these, these terms, and at the, at the far end, suicide. I'm very skeptical, as you'll find out throughout the night, very skeptical about people's uh, altruistic motives. 
and the media that is conveying this conversation currently, I'm very skeptical about their motives and their, their genuine care about what issues people are actually dealing with. Number one, because I know some of them personally. I know the people at ESPN, and they're not good people. How many people watch ESPN? Yeah. Yeah. My, my fears are confirmed. <laughs> Are, 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 are deep in our communities. Um, they're not all bad people, though. I don't want you to go home and watch ESPN like, you know, a terror or anything. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, the, the diagnostic terms are for insurance companies, and I believe that. And when he said it, it felt true. It felt true. Um, and, and one of the things that I've been trying to emphasize to communities is that the reason why these diagnostic terms, anxiety, and even we could take the term mental health, are not for the public is because most of you guys don't come across these diagnoses. Every, there's a lot of people in this room, any, anybody here, if you're comfortable, have a mental health diagnosis. exercise earlier with the junior high students too and the same thing was the case was it was it not yeah so it's like that's about like eight of you thank you for sharing too I have one too obviously so we're all on the same train um, but that's about like one third of the people in here even less like one fifth and the reason is is because that statistics statistically that maps on to the greater society most people don't get diagnosed but that doesn't mean you all aren't dealing with these issues. So, I'll help you with that. How many people in here have ever felt anxiety? Okay, that's a way different number than the people are diagnosed already. Okay, let's go beyond the, the, the mental health term. Let's go to uh, raw emotion. Let's go, how many people in here have ever felt happiness? Raise your hand. Yeah, good. Everybody, excited. Excitement. Good. Um, sadness. Yeah. Anger. <laughs> stress. I can go on down the list, right? Yeah. The whole list. You guys have all felt it. Way different than the number of people who are diagnosed. Now, the question is, how is that the case? Well, number one is there's a huge issue about access to care. And the access to care... <coughs> would be the access to diagnosis. So, without you raising your hand, I'm sure there are issues around access to care, even in this room, okay? There's issues around access to care in our entire country and the world, okay? So there, that's one of the reasons why these issues are underreported is because there's a reporting problem. So, when you're going about thinking about mental health and how to deal with it, as I told some of the coaches earlier, some of the, the, the students, some of the adults, and the, the teachers, assume you already have these issues. And I see a lot of confused faces, like, what is this guy saying to me? Assume I have a mental health issue. Yes. Yes, assume you have an issue. Because the things that you would do to treat these issues, the things you would do to treat anxiety, the things you would do to treat depression, the things you would do to treat OCD, the things you would do to treat PTSD, would be good for you whether or not you have a clinical diagnosis. Or whether or not your struggles fit an insurance company's criteria. And often, what's becoming more clear to me is the insurance companies like to create this really rigid criteria so they don't have to pay for you to get help. Good. So we can assume that the insurance companies aren't going to be your allies when you're, you're seeking a treatment. So you're going to have to be your own ally. And in being your own ally, you're going to have to have some, some good information and some honest facts about who you are. Right? So we're going to reshape the mental health definition for you. We've just done that. It's clear that you guys are all crazy in here. <laughs> okay? um, and that's good. That's good, now that we got that out of the way, uh, <laughs> we, can have, we can have an honest conversation. I'm surely crazy. I, I told the, the junior high students earlier that 
I'm now transitioning into mixed martial arts. And obviously you guys know that the goal of two mixed martial artists in competition is to separate each other from their consciousness. That's fundamentally crazy. <laughs> so I'm a nut job, much more crazy than you are. And now we can have a, a nice, good conversation. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, uh, the, the most important thing that, that I've learned on this journey is, is the mechanism of honesty. And that's how I've been able to get through and navigate having anxiety, dealing with anxiety. Um, it's just being honest with myself first and then with others. And the two work together. And that's, that's it. That's, that's all I, that, you know, that's, that's my mental health spiel. Um, seems really, really basic and simple. But at the end of the day, it, it, it is that simple. It is that simple. This mental health topic is the most important topic in your life. There's a whole bunch of other topics out there uh, that, are, that are trying to infiltrate the attention. And at the end of the day, they're all just, they're all just underneath this mental health umbrella. The mental health topic is about your mind. It's about the way that you wake up in the morning and decide to live your life and, and, and even the remnants of your daily choices on into your sleep and doing it all over again the next day. It's really the biggest issue that you'll, you'll ever face. It's the biggest issue we'll all ever face. And so it's paramount. And I can't tell you how to navigate it. Now, if you have a question about anxiety and how to stop panic attacks like most people have had today, then I can certainly give you some, some tips on that. And I'm sure that question will pop up. Um, but as far as the conversation itself, all I can do is give you the framework. And all I can do is invite you um, and encourage you to dive into the topic. It's taught me a great number of things uh, already in 12 short years of, of being introduced to it. Uh, and it's really helped shape who I am in a positive way, in a positive way. Like I said, all of the, the tools that I use to navigate dealing with my anxiety would be good for everybody in this room, whether or not you have anxiety. And we've already gotten past the fact that most of you do have anxiety. So, questions. I know this is gonna this is gonna spill over. Let's go questions. Quick, quicker. So when you were when you never at your age, you never seen mental health and mental illness, there is a, yeah. an absolute difference. That's a good question. That yeah, I didn't put you guys hear me. Yeah, I also hear me better. Can you hear me back? You just better than me. With the mic? Okay, good, okay. That's a good question. The question is, is the differentiation between mental health and mental illness. Like, uh, mental health is an umbrella. A mental illness is, in, in my opinion, uh, just what it says. It's, it's, a, it's a trouble. It's, a, it's a, an issue within the pursuit of being healthy mentally. Yeah. Um, differentiating is going to be more clear cut than then we would want to, then we think in this theoretical conversation, right? Like when you have anxiety uh, to the point where it becomes, meets, meets a clinical criteria, you, you probably are gonna know, right? The dangerous part, and, and this is why I have trouble trying to tell people where to draw the line is, it's gonna be very individual based. So that makes it seem, that might make it seem like it's, you know, kind of a fandom issue, kind of hard to pin down, but it's not. It's not the, 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 the right framework would be to say, if you have an issue in your life or if you have something going on in your life where you're not getting the results you want, mental health is probably at the root of it. Now, what issue that is related to mental health is what needs to be discovered, but there's no doubt that that's what needs to be discovered. And I gave this example to the, the junior high students earlier also. Let's take anxiety, for example. What would some of the traditional symptoms of, of anxiety be reported as? Rapid breathing, Rapid breathing nervousness, sweaty palms, uh, blurry vision, fear, doom, thinking you're going to die, you know, these things. But insomnia wouldn't be. Yet insomnia is probably more prevalent than all of them combined when it comes to anxiety. 
So how many people ain't got trouble sleeping? Those hands aren't high enough. <laughs> there might be an insomnia stigma in this room. <laughs> yeah. So we have some insomnia in the room, some, some sleep disturbance. It, it's, it's reported that like 90 million Americans have insomnia, and 90 to 95% of those insomnias are related to anxiety. So remember how there was only eight people in here that put their hands up about anxiety? And, and like 25 of you had sleep issues? You guys don't know that that's anxiety related yet. And I don't know why. But you heard it here first. You guys have anxiety. <laughs> uh, so, but that's what I mean, right? Uh, it becomes less important to try and differentiate what we mean by mental health and mental illness. That's something for very judgmental and very exploitive people to do. Yeah. Yes. Is, is mental health something that we're wired for when they were born, or is it a, is it a, 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 a because of, he said an event triggered yours? Is yep. it something that just happens because of our environment, or nature versus nurture? We got that question a lot today too. The young people ask that. You guys have some smart young people in this community. I want to say that. First of all, because these same questions were, were echoed even in the seventh grade, the youngest group. So, hats off to you, uh, your, your community. No, um, nature versus nurture is a good question. I don't know. That's a God answer. You know, um, I'd say a bit of both. Probably is a safe bet. Genetic predisposition for alcoholism, drug abuse, anxiety, depression seems more clear. You know, more clear every day. Um, but I'm still skeptical of science in some ways too, and, and how sure they are, or how sure they are as to how they came to that conclusion. Uh, I know it's prevalent in my family, so anecdotally it would seem to match up. But also, what I went through in my life played a role too. So a bit of both. And the example I always give is that, um, oh, that's directional. <laughs> uh, the, the alcohol question. The big one is around addiction. And it seems more clear that addic addictive personality traits can be linked genetically. Okay, so for me, I know this is true. I know this is true. This is how I know it's true. Socially, I've never been a motivated drinker. I've always looked at drinking and drug abuse um, with a side eye, partially because I'm an athlete. So we were just trained to, to kind of look at that that way. Which was super hypocritical because they sell alcohol and a lot of athletes end up doing drugs and alcohol. They created the stigma almost for us, but it benefited me. Um, when I started to drink, when I got older, 18, once I had that drinking experience, and then anytime I drank after that, I was very cautious about how much I drank because I was aware of the alcohol history of my family. My grandfather died when he was about, my great grandfather died when he was about 74 years old. Uh, he was diagnosed with lung cancer that had already made it to his brain, so he was in bad shape already when he got diagnosed. Gave him six to seven days to live. Lived for seven months. Went to the bar, smoked and drank whiskey every, every day for those seven months. So, yeah, there's, there's, and he wasn't the only one. There's been alcoholism through the entire family. So, um, I try to stay away from alcohol, but I can actually tell now if somebody's drinking around me, if my friends are, if I'm at an event, Couples party, I'm married now. People are drinking, my mouth will water. That, that doesn't come from me partaking in drinking. That's something that's wired in me. So yeah, we have to be very mindful about what we do before we have children and the effect it may have on those children. Yeah. Is there a chance that if you have alcoholism in your family and you refrain from alcohol or you refrain from uh, creating that alcoholic habit, that maybe the, the children that you have won't have it? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Tall task, though. Another piece I'll just add to the alcohol piece is uh, clinical psychologist named Jordan Peterson. Some of you may know. Anybody know Jordan Peterson here? Look him up. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. Came into contact with him when I was in Canada uh, playing. He's a professional uh, clinical psych psychologist uh, at Toronto, 
the election targeting. And uh, he has a great segment about alcoholism. And what I like about him is he's really honest about it. He's like, no, alcohol's fun. Alcohol's great. There's no question about why people drink alcohol. The question is, what does it do to you? And what meaningful thing will you need in your life to deter you from doing it? So, what thing in your life is so important to you that you will not get drunk so that you don't mess it up? That's a tough question for all of us to answer. But it could be job, it could be kids, it could be marriage, it could be a whole number of things. It should be general health. <laughs> but often it's not going to be that. <laughs> that. That should be the answer of general health, but it's not that one. Good question. More questions. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, my future is coming to talk to, uh, talk to people about it. No. Um, no, that's a good question. I think it's tough to say. It's going to be different for most people. I think most people will, well, first of all, let's start by saying this. Everybody would benefit from going to talk to somebody. When we talk about therapy, the baseline should just be that you're going to need a therapist. So one of the things that I think people do falsely is to tell themselves that their ability to have what they view as a successful life is, or, or even a, a life that seems intact or a, a life that seems like it's going okay, that that's evidence that they don't need to talk to somebody. No. People are very resilient. And, and a lot of the things that have deep, deep, uh, effects on us, we're able to push through and still create a, a daily life that resembles some sort of order. So I don't, I don't, I think everybody in here should just, should be talking to somebody. Therapy should be like the baseline for society at this point, especially with everything we've introduced to it. So do I think you'll ever be at a point where you should need a therapist? I don't think you'll be at a point where you could go without talking to a therapist. Of course, a lot of people could, could go without talking to a therapist. Um, do I think that there are cures to mental health? No. no. Do I think that you can manage your, 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 your mental health and, and get much better results than whatever you're getting? Always. Always. So one of my uh, anxiety coping mechanisms I, I told the young people was square breathing. How many of you know what square breathing is? Raise your hand. Only a few. Oh, when I come back next year, it should be all of you. All of you need to know what square breathing is. One of the, the biggest issues, obviously, is that people breathe improperly. The, the, the positive effects that breathing properly will have on your mental health, but your general health, are astonishing. Everybody here is like, yeah, 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 okay. But none of you will go home and do it. Please just go home and take five minutes and introduce yourself to breathing properly. So um, things like that can always make you more healthy, whether or not you have a mental health issue that you know about or not. Yeah. Mental health, the whole, the, the whole conversation will help you regardless. More questions? Yep, in the back. I don't know if you're talking about breathing properly, but research on it, and we have started doing belly breathing, we call it. There it is. For our athletes. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. Belly breathing, belly breathing is a, a part of the square breathing. Belly breathing is, is to tell you where to breathe from. The, the square part is to tell you what, what uh, cadence to breathe in. Yeah. Most of us just breathe really shallow. Uh, or we breathe out. Okay, let me tell you what square breathing is first. <laughs> For all of you people who are not going to go home on YouTube. Okay, square breathing is you take a square, you can take any shape of a square, or you can draw a square, and you're going to breathe in for seven seconds, you're going to hold at the end of each line, you're going to breathe out for five seconds, and then hold. So seven, 
hold, five, hold, seven, hold, five, okay. Until you start to feel better. And sure fire, you're gonna feel better. There's nothing negotiable or up in the air about square breathing. There's definitely questions about what is real. Square breathing is not one of those questions. It, it works. So, good question. Yeah, belly breathing, great. Great. More questions. What's, yeah. what's, what's the best way to support somebody with something like anxiety, um, just in everyday life and then maybe in an, during an anxiety attack? <clears throat> Good question. Support, best way to support. Um, I hear this all the time and, and uh, I was on the Storm Lake in, in Iowa Falls when, when this kind of hit me mid-speech mid is that <coughs> one of the common threads that you hear about the mental health situation, the, the mental health problem in America and anywhere, is that people don't ask for help. How many of you have heard this? People don't ask for help. All right, yeah. It's bullshit. <laughs> it's grade A bullshit. People are asking for help all the time in their own way. People aren't using terms like anxiety because as we learned earlier, most of you people in here aren't diagnosed. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not asking for help. People are asking for help all the time, and people are being dismissed. So the first thing you can do to support somebody who's having these issues is not dismiss them. Don't dismiss them. Not just because they might have an issue, it's more reasonable not to dismiss them because you have the issue. So, there's that. Don't dismiss them. Yeah. After that, how you support them specifically is going to depend on what it is they're dealing with. Yeah. So, and, and then they'll tell you what they need, too. So, and, and if you're in one of those unique positions, and this, this question has come up a lot where people may not have all of the tools to articulate to you exactly how they need help and, and then what do you do? Like if you're a parent and there's a kid who, you know, doesn't know exactly what's going on with them or vice versa. If you're a child and your parent doesn't know what's going on with them, how do you address that? Uh, that's the most difficult question that we possibly have in society is, is how, to, how to navigate when there's a, a silence Promote honesty. You guys need to create environments in your in your homes, in your communities, where there's a premium on honesty. And so for the very few people that, that won't take to that, that, that culture of honesty, then we can't help everybody. And that's the tough, that's a tough answer that nobody wants to really hear. But before you write those people off that won't tell you won't ask for support. Ask yourself, have you truly created a culture of honesty? And I guarantee you there'll be much more work there that you could do to create a culture of honesty than you're, than you're admitting. Good question. Where's the, there's another one. Yes. Have you been in therapy since you've been diagnosed? Yes. Yep. Therapy since 16. Yep. Different therapists too, along the way. Interesting, just most interesting people, therapists. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's been good, though. It's been good. Learned a lot. Learned a lot about myself. Learned a lot about them. Uh, therapists, you know, often <coughs> use their own life or use their own situations or struggles, at least with me, to help, you know, help you understand things better. Um, and it's, it's part of the reason, you know, it, it clicked for me, like, around. 19, I was just leaving Iowa State when I was going into the draft because I had talked about this issue publicly and, and it was in the national media, ESPN front page type type of deal. How many how many messages and things I was receiving about other people's struggles. So help me get to know a lot of other people. Yes. With, with, you know, more, more levels, I suppose, yep. Or however. Yeah. Did I outgrow any of the issues that I had earlier? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, so, I mean, yes and no. Yes and no. 
Do I think that there are cases where people can outgrow issues? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I hear about that all the time. People tell me about them outgrowing issues all the time. I assume half of those people are lying. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe that that, that is a possibility. Um, when I first started having anxiety, a lot of my, uh, my fear was around my own general health. So I had a, a real hypochondria, you know. Um, I got over that pretty quickly, actually, uh, relatively. It took me to 21 to really stop calling my doctor and asking him, am I going to have a heart attack? Yeah, but, but once, you know, after the thousandth time of him saying, you're not having a heart attack, uh, I'm pretty good with the heart attack thing. I think my heart's going to be all right. Not 100% sure, though, yeah. So that's why I'm saying I don't know if growing up, I wouldn't say I grew out of it completely, but it, it has changed a lot. Yeah, and I think that is common too. Okay. I am very proud that, you know, most times we go to the doctor and we want a pill. Mm -hmm. But I'm very happy to talk about dealing with how you deal with your anxiety. Yeah. How to get over it. I've gone to a, a continuing continu education and they talk about, you know, kids dealing with depression. Some, some stuff now. Yeah, okay. I'm a nurse and I'm always, we're always taught to never talk about it. politics or, or not, <laughs> or not, in no, not in no Royce White presentation. <laughs> <laughs> the politics and the faith are on the table. Okay. It's not seriously, that's that's funny. But we gotta ask ourselves what we mean by culture of honesty. And if we think that our politics and our faith are outside the scope of things that would add pressure to de-incentivize somebody in sharing their struggles, we are lying. Yeah. So there's a question about what being honest is, even, even on that level. Okay, so the question was about faith. Does that come into the therapy? Okay, I'll answer that question in a second. But what I will say is that this entire mental health conversation is as much a matter of philosophy, it's as much of a philosophical issue as it is a medical issue. Okay, so the medical world is there to try and solve your issues once you already have them. There's a lot of money in that. They're not there to proactively, proactively solve your issues, right? So the, that's where the pilling thing comes from. That's why he, my therapist said, the diagnosis are for insurance companies. Because once you get to a diagnosis, the next path is to prescription. That's clear. Um, so when we, when we say philosophy, well, why? Why is the mental health conversation a philosophical one? Because angst and despair are at the root of all of these mental health questions. All of these mental health issues, angst and despair. Angst and despair are not medical terms. They're philosophical terms. And they're not terms that can be cured. They're emergent. Unless, this is the one, the less, when you talk about faith, unless you resign from society. And so that's what the Eastern philosophers and Buddhists, Taoists, you know, our, our, our Eastern faiths, that's what they practiced and they mastered in many regards, which is why a lot of our meditative practices and our breathing practices come from that part of the world. They've resigned from society, they've thrown in the towel, and said that man is flawed, and any society that man would erect would have us wayward. They're pretty much right, <laughs> to be honest. The flip side of that coin is our culture, the Western culture, which is founded on Judeo-Christian values and primarily the narrative of self-sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ, but it's also all of the other figures of the Judeo-Christian 
great. And so, yeah, us in the Western world, we can't resign from society, which is why it makes sense that we adapt to the Judeo-Christian faith. So the call for us is to, to find the, the proper balance of, of faith and self-sacrifice and discipline and so on and so forth in the chaos, not away from it. It's like Jesus could have just avoided the entire debacle altogether and have to pick a battle with the, with the Jewish rabbis and the, you know, those, and have to pick a battle with Rome. He didn't have to do any of it, but he did. So, yeah. Faith is a huge part of, of, uh, of this journey for me. And uh, there's a complete walkout on faith, too. I don't know if you Iowans are aware of that, because Iowa was its own thing. I'm proud of that. <laughs> you guys seem to have your own thing going, but in the rest of the world, there's a complete walkout on faith altogether. So, specifically, Judeo-Christian values, which is unfortunate. I think it's the wrong move. I think the sins of the church and the people individually that are involved with the church are not to be used to completely dismiss all of the, the wisdom in, in Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah, okay. Next question. We opened that can of words. Let's go, let's go somewhere else. Yeah. You, you talked to the students about five coping strategies. Right. You discussed one with a square breathing. Could you maybe just point out, point out the other four? Yeah, my top five are writing, reading, Exercise, vitamin D, and square breathing. Um, all the are vitamin D deficient. I already know that. That's that's a sure fact there. Um, you live in North Oklahoma, you're vitamin D deficient. So go get some vitamin D supplements. I want the high D vitamin D section at the Jefferson High D here to be needing vitamin D uh, restock often. It's one of the first things my doctor did when she diagnosed me. It's handed me a, a, a jar of uh, 2,000 IE vitamin D supplements. Yep. And it started working right away. It's the mood regulator. That's why people who are in the sun more and get the sun is a, is a natural giver of vitamin D. People who live in, in dark places, cold places, there's an effect. Now, does that mean you can't be happy in a cold place? As a matter of fact, the Midwest is generally a cold, cold place, and I think that we're much happier than the, the coasts. <laughs> Probably because you know living on the coast is gives you a whole different uh, different issue. I don't, I don't know exactly what that is. We'll have to research it. But the vitamin D is is an issue. It is an issue, no doubt. So writing, reading, exercise, vitamin D, square breathing. Probably battle any of these issues with, with those five things. And what do you mean for your coping scripture, daily devotion? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've read the Bible so many times that it's. I, I revisit, revisit some scripture sometimes, but um, I like to read new things, new information. Yeah. And so a lot of, a lot of the anxiety. Oh, here's one theory I have. One theory I have. Okay. This is a new one. I, I didn't say this earlier, and I didn't say this in Iowa Falls. Here's one theory I have. Uh, we've been given a lot of information, a lot of new information, a lot of new information fast. And the way consciousness probably works is interconnected. So if the smartest people on the planet learn something new, its implications, you know, whether you're aware of them or not. That's my takeaway. Would you repeat? So, say it again. Would you say that again? Okay, I'll say it again. I will. I'm just, I won't see you. I got you. Okay, so consciousness is interconnected. We already had our best psychologists, you know, Carl Jung and Freud. Freud was stigmatized through the roof. He's, dismissed a lot, especially in his time. He's still not given the credit that he's deserved. But, but 
but these geniuses already proposed that consciousness was it was interconnected between people. So uh, it's my belief that as information is unearthed or as we acquire new information, that the effect is for all of us, right? Which is why I read the to an, the reason why I say that is to answer the question. I read new things, yeah, and that kind of heals it because there's that ang you know angst is primarily about uncertainty. Well, how uncertain are you if you read a bunch of information that you have no clue what it is? Right? So, there was a time when you, you didn't turn on the news at all, first of all. We got to look at humanity and time in the proper span. 50 years, some of us have you know, been alive 50, 25, 15 years. Maybe 90 at the most, 100, I don't know. Society is much, much longer than that. Um, there was a time when you couldn't even turn on the news. Then you could turn on the news. Now you can't turn on the news. Yeah. So what does that, what are the implications of that? Especially when the news is always terrifying. Same with what's your take on you know, social media. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's it. Pull them into it. Bait them. I said the traps. Um, okay, can I... Tim, can I get my can I get my Terminator scenario? Sure. This group's gonna know Terminator, aren't they? Terminator, raise your hands. None of your children have seen Terminator. <laughs> this is a problem. This is a big problem. Okay. Okay. So we all know the Terminator scenario. We all know that the question about artificial intelligence and the fear that now that you know. So it's 40 years after Terminator was actually made. We're actually starting to figure out how to do it, which should scare a lot of you. Okay, it's scary. Um, the Terminator scenario is already gone. It's, it's already gone. We're in it. We're already in it. And the killer robots are you all. Seriously. You all are the killer robots. Me, you, everybody out there. And the death that you will face will not be physical. It will be spiritual and psychological. So, yeah, social media is the terminator, basically. Yeah. There's no consequence. There's no real meaning. There's no attachment. There's certainly no honesty. There's no filtration of, of, uh, of discipline on how one should conduct themselves. It's only what one can get away with and how they conduct themselves. So it's all transactional. It's, you know, if I can get away with it, then I can do it. And to show you this, actually how it plays out, the infamous Snapchat app created a system where the messages you send disappear. Now, they want you to believe that that's about privacy, but ah, it surely isn't. <laughs> it isn't. It's to take away the consequence of your interaction there. And as a bunch of other smart tech vultures would do, they implemented that same feature to their platform. So, yeah, social media. Now, I was posed with the question in Des Moines, a young woman. She could have been more than 16 years old. She says, well, if there was no internet and there was no social media, how would we know what was going on in China? <laughs> yeah, she's actually right. She's actually right. There is, there is another side of that coin, you know. Um, the questions about, you know, totalitarian governments and withholding of information, this, this whole thing, I have a chapter on this in my, my next book, uh, which is a letter to LeBron James, where I talk about this technocracy, and make no mistake about it, you Iowans have, have preserved your sovereignty and, and, and your agriculture, but the technocracy is at your doorstep nonetheless, right? So, yeah, okay. Um, I, I say in, in, in this chapter that Whether or not 
you subscribe you know, to these platforms, whether or not you engage in these platforms, the, the culture that they're creating is, is, is like an avalanche. You know? And so, yeah, tough, tough. It's, uh, the, the, the China piece, for example, it's like, yeah, you may not know what was going on in China if, you, if we didn't have the internet, but you gotta ask yourself, and I told the young lady this, you have to ask yourself, she said to me, she, first of all, she said, well, how would we know what's going on in, in China and how we could help them? First of all, you gotta ask yourself, well, what do you mean by help them? Be weary of these people who purport themselves to be altruistic journeymen, so to speak. Like the CNN, or yeah, really CNN, <laughs> MSNBC, I don't know, really. those, those people. Be wary of those people. So are they really showing you China because they want to help China? Or they want you to help China? Or do, you, do they want you to watch people talk about what we should do to help China? It's clear. They're not, they're not trying to help China. They're not, they're not against censorship. <coughs> They're not against totalitarian governments. They kicked Mark Lamont Hill out of CNN for talking in favor of Palestine. That's about as censoring and totalitarian as you can get. So she understood that. Another young bright eyed little girl. She was like, oh, yeah, you're right. They're finishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So the point is that, yes, information has become more accessible with the internet. The question is, do we have enough wisdom to accompany the amount of information that we've been given? And the answer is an astounding no. No. So I asked the question yesterday in Des Moines, auditorium of 560 high schoolers who had philosophy class in their school. One row in the entire 560 students, about eight students, even had philosophy offered. <coughs> So if you've been given infinite information and no philosophy, you're a determined, you're a killer robot. Yeah. Good question. Next question. Yes. So, I'm glad that I didn't have that. Yeah. But yeah. do you think that'll hurt? We, all, we didn't have it at the time. I mean, I'm 28. We didn't even have it. You know, the first cell phone we had it still had snake and yeah. they didn't even have color. <laughs> they were like that, you know, off that off tan screen with the with the specky black marks. I don't even know what I don't know what those were even made of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's going to be scary. It's a, it's a scary proposition that everything's at their fingertips. But it's, it's not the cause, though, so don't get that mistaken. It's a symptom. It's the symptom of your generation not addressing your mental health issues. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's the symptom. You create kids that you don't really want to have to watch and love and, and create discipline in, so you give them their iPad. Not you specifically. <laughs> Not you sound parents of Iowa. <laughs> God, I'm never going to be invited back here. So this dude came in and said we don't parent well. No. But, but collectively, remember I talked about a collective consciousness. Is, is that was the collective unconscious you know, direction of society, of our American society. And as history would have it, our American society then infected the rest of the world with it. So, yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that's, it's just a symptom. It's a symptom. And it's a dangerous one, no doubt. No doubt. And the, and the bullying isn't just an issue for young people on there. The bullying is an issue for adults. And, and I've actually watched something strange happen with social media specifically. I've watched it become, i watched different social media platforms become for different groups 
people age specific too, right? So I don't, I don't even see people my age or most people or people younger than me on Facebook. Everybody that's on Facebook are my mom and aunts and grandma, right? But there's no shortage of chaos on Facebook because it's the days when the, uh, seriously, it's the same, it's the same thing. And, and I tell the younger people this when they ask you the question about social media, the, the, the truism that you have to walk away with if nothing else. So every conversation that you have is going to have its, its good and its bad. It's going to have its, its angels and its demons. And so the people who built these social media platforms, the people who maintain them, the people who uh, innovate for them, who try and create better social media platforms, are psychologists. Even more reason why you should go home and dive into the mental health topic so you can be equipped with the people that seek to have your mind and your attention. Our psychologists, they're good at it. They know what they're doing. And I asked the question earlier to young people, what's the feeling that you get? What's the feeling that you get when you open up your app and you're waiting to see if that red notification pops up, if somebody's actually paid attention to you or is, is, is noticing you or has commented on something, has affirmed you? or whether or not you're looking for them to have said something disparaging or against you. What's that feeling you get right there when that happens? Doesn't matter what your answer is, you're already addicted. Doesn't matter how you describe the high of heroin. Point is, you need to get high. Yeah, so. Another question. Personally, yeah, um, yeah. Well, the, the the worst thing that the media did, I would say, was tell all of you that the reason why I couldn't pursue my goal or dream was because I couldn't get on an airplane. Not only was it not true, just fundamentally not true. I can't get on an airplane. I've been on an airplane many times, more than most people. The motive and why they told you that is is what's Egregious, it's heinous, you know. It's to keep your, your eyes away from the importance of this mental health conversation so that they don't have to look in the mirror themselves. Right? If they keep you from looking in the mirror, then it'll be hard for you to notice somebody else who doesn't look in the mirror. It's like one big uh, zombie. Yeah, Terminator. <laughs> Killing robots. You know, um, you know how robots, you know how they depict robots and they walk kind of with without this personality, that's not by accident, because you, you realize like they're trying to figure out how to build robots, and like they can make a robot walk normal. So why are we always depicted that they walk without this soul? Yeah, that's the avoidance of looking in the mirror. Robots can't do it. It's their numbers. God, I don't think there's anything that it can be compared to. You know, the, 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 the temptation is to, to compare it to other fanatic religious movements, like the Inquisition, or you know, things like that. Things where people's attention and, and their, their commitment or their identity was so tied into a thing um, that they started to lose vision, started to blind them. Uh, I don't think, I think this is 10 times worse. 10 times worse. Which is to go back to why I said that it, it's, it's uh, a sleight of hand. <laughs> uh, I almost said something too politically incorrect. But <laughs> it's a sleight of hand that the people that erected this entire internet social media culture were a part of the abnegation of Jesus. There's this 
there's what we call a, a, a we, I say we, me and my constituents, friends, that are just looking out at the landscape. We run this, the, the last renaissance. We call it this Judeo-Buddhist movement. And uh, it's, it's, it's to say we're going to resign from society when we want to, selectively. And so we can, we can cast an aspersion about other people's morals and ethics, you, you people, usually, you know, the lower group, the, lower, the, the group that's not here on this, this scientific technological tower that can look down at everybody else and, and say how silly or dumb they are. And, and we can cast an aspersion of morals and ethics on you, you know, uh, decrepit people, but, but no consideration of those morals and ethics in the things we create. Because in the things we create, we have the excuse of natural curiosity. Yeah. So, as I told the, you know, so the, the coaches earlier, and I was asked by some of the coaches, you know, what, what can we do? What I'm telling you now is we've gone beyond mental health. Really, we have. Mental, mind, body, spirit. So we have, but this is a much bigger conversation about people and society. What can we do? Cut the shit. Cut the shit. Don't act like you can create the proper amount of, of internet exposure for your kids, because you can't. You can't. There's going to be a choice. The choice is for everybody to make in here. Yay or nay. And if you go yay, then you've opened yourself up to all the things that may come with it. And, and so that's that's not a you know that's not a, a, a condemnation. It's just it is what it is. You know, if I decide to smoke cigarettes, I've opened myself up to the possibility of lung cancer. But not only lung cancer, emphysema, the things that come with it, the chemo, the operation, the effect on my loved ones, and right on down the trial. So yeah, daunting, daunting nonetheless. What would I say do? Take the social media away from your kids. And they're going to do it anyway. But us as adults, we, we have to, in my opinion, with our, first of all, take the social media away from yourself. Yeah. We as adults have to create clear lines with our behavior and our, and our messages about where these moral and ethical lines will, will be drawn. Because I think a part of this generation before, before my generation, you guys' generation as adults, and the one before that, um, look to institutions and structures to help uh, craft young people. You know what I mean? So you relied on their school to uphold the moral values. You relied on the church to uphold the values. Hell, you relied on the neighborhood to uphold the values. That's gone. So the premium just went up on each adult in their household to make clear that line of those values. Tough to do. Shows you the interconnectedness because now your kid goes to school and everybody else has social media and they feel left out. Well, hey, you gotta make choices. You gotta make choices now. We've pushed it to that spot. So if your kid's getting bullied, is it really a symptom of the kids and, and the, the other kids and their, their meanness, or is it a, is it a symptom of the, the, the sacrifice that your community was never willing to make? If you're the one mom who's smart enough to say the social media is toxic and then your kid goes to school and the other kid's going, your mom won't let you be on social media, ha ha. You gotta be able to sleep at night with that and you gotta be able to convey that to your, 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 your child that this is you know, it's about faith. Tough to do. Oh, tough to do. I can't do it. I can't do it yet. So, I'm a bit hypocritical up here. <laughs> um, but what I do have to hold some solace in, in my own participation on social media is that I actively fight against those norms with every waking moment on social media. And Jeff knows if you go to my Twitter, if you go to my Instagram, every, almost annoyingly, you know, I'm there going, nope, nope, wrong, nope, cut the shit. That's bullshit, you know, so. You are gonna be on there, 
your your fingerprints on there, your presence on there, sure as hell better better have some walls and ethics. Something that your kid can, you know, when they stumble upon mom's Facebook, do they see just another projection of, of, of the way that they are and their friends are on Facebook? Because nothing could be worse. You know, you should be able to look to mom and parents and adults and, and see a, a resemblance of order, even if you know you don't have it yourself as a young person. social media seminar. <laughs> it's good. It's the question, though. It is the question. More questions, please. More. Yes. So think back and tell me what you wish your teachers or your coaches knew that you didn't talk to. Um, my teachers and coaches did a pretty good job, to be honest, in all fairness. In all fairness to the fact that this conversation really wasn't wasn't happening yet, certainly wasn't happening like this. Um, they did a pretty good job. And, and so what they did was, now, now their motives can be questioned also, because I had a unique childhood. I was an All-American athlete at 15 years old. So everybody around me was incentivized to keep me on the path, if not for their individual gain, just for the, the societal narrative that the one who was out in front be pushed forward. Um, so I had all those advantages. But I come from a, a real honest group of people, too. So there was a cut the shit doctrine that, you know, I didn't just develop that. You know, when you hear that, that that's my mom and dad and grandparents and uncles and, you know, older, older uh, role models within the neighborhood and my barber and you know, people in the theater, strange that people in the theater who act all the time would be the ones to, you know, help with that. But, you know, I had good people. Now, what you should do, <laughs> or, or what I would subscribe for other people to do, is create a culture of honesty. And that's that's not easy. It's because I, I, I asked, I have a, a best friend, and we had a whole conversation about this scenario that you guys may know about, maybe you hear on these social medias or in the news, about black people being shot, unarmed by the police. How many are familiar with this? Okay, good. This have to do with it. <laughs> Not really nothing. Police have the highest reporting of mental health issues in the modern profession. Number one. High in domestic abuse, high in alcohol addiction. So it's not nothing. Um, but regardless, that wasn't the conversation that my best friend were having. Uh, we were talking about how people are talking about it and and what they should be talking about. And so is it that America is so unjust that the value of black lives are not represented or not protected by the, by the court? Because that's what we're talking about. Once somebody's been shot, then what is the, is the penalty going to, to be just, right? And he pointed out to me the other day, this was just seven days ago, we were having this conversation. He said, what people are missing out on is that the prosecutors are just as incompetent as the rest of society, right? So we've created this narrative where we think that, that, that we're gonna be able to pick and choose where the ills are. We're gonna be able to pick and choose where the ills are and how they're affecting us. Or, and, and we're gonna be able to pick and choose that with what we choose to say about it. As, it's, as if our conversation is gonna change the underlying reality. And so I tell you that to say, what we had to do, what, what I would subscribe people to do, is to be honest and creating that culture of honesty. We have to first be honest about you. And, and you have to be really honest. I said earlier to the coaches, not the honesty that you can get away with looking like you're honest. Not convincing him of being honest. It's not to convince somebody that I'm being honest, it's to actually be honest. And usually that's gonna come with risk. And it's going to come with the damage of reputation. It's going to come with the compromise of your position. For example, with the kid. Am I, going to, am I going to be honest about the things that I failed at or the things that I've, I've dealt with at the risk of them of undermining my own authority with them? 
See? If the answer is no, then we're in trouble. But if you can find a way to do that, that's the culture of honesty. And is that to say that the kid is going to then be healed or solved or he won't have mental health issues? Not at all. No, that's not saying that at all. What it's saying that is if you have a chance at all to get on the right side of helping a person with their issue, the culture of honesty has to be the baseline. Or else it's just going to be one big circle of lies. It's also why the, uh, the faith piece and the Jesus Christ piece is so relevant. Like, thou shalt not lie. Tried to throw that one out quick, didn't they? <laughs> this Judeo Buddhist technocracy. Just do away with the thou shalt not lie. Now it's speak your truth. Just whatever your truth is is good. It's super convenient. <clears throat> super convenient. Just whatever I feel like today. Skip over the fact that a lot of times I'll just wake up and feel like lying. Thoughts on violent? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No. Thoughts on violent video games and violent video games. younger children? Good question. Great question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going. I'm going no. Hard no. It's an easy one. It's an easy one. Yeah. I think if um, you know, there, there's a whole argument that exposing kids to some things will help normalize them. Violence isn't one of them. It, it neglects how primal and how old the propensity towards violence is in people and what it invokes and what it sparks and, and what it precursors, you know. Um, it's the wrong version of exposure therapy. Yeah. Your kid can, again, it, it, it was the first step of the social media crisis. Mm. Right? That was the first, that was the first Terminator. That was the, the Trojan horse. And then they connected it and now you got social media, now you're real life avatar. And can walk through the social media world and be this fake person. But in the video game, you have no consequences. You have unlimited lives. It's absolutely ridiculous. <coughs> you know, not only do you have unlimited lives, it's just not adventurous. Then you add violence on top of your life. You know, gun, you know, shooting games. And so, you know, adults, adults can, can do better to, to, to deal with that type of information, I think. Don't think it's necessarily healthy for them either. But I think adults can, you know, handle that somewhat. Not eight, nine, ten. I mean, there's eight-year-olds playing Call of Duty. Like, there's no reason your eight-year-old needs a character with a real gun. And the screen rewards him when he shoots a character in the head. It's like, guys, there's no wonder there's a crisis of cops showing up <laughs> and shooting people without, you know, identifying themselves as cops. Sure. Not sure. I used to get nervous. I used to get nervous when I was like younger. Actually, I'll tell you this. We used to go over to my, my family member's house a lot, extended family. How much time we got? 10, 20 minutes? 10 minutes. Okay. We used to go to my extended families a lot and uh, yeah, have dinner, watch movies, and things like that. And some of the movies, some of the content in the movies used to disturb me to the point where I can now realize that it was anxiety. Um, but I used to have this uh, this phenomenon where my eyes would rattle back and forth. They would start to shake. And the way I dealt with it was I would just, I would just go to sleep wherever we were. I would just close my eyes because that's really all I could do. But I wouldn't tell anybody. Because, I mean, you know, the family gathers around to watch the one TV in the, in the house with Blue Collar Home. It's like, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. Yeah, so... Um, but I, I don't know if I don't know if it'd be fair to ask that anybody would be able to notice that at that time. Because again, it, I was smart enough at eight years old to, to hide that from people. So, you know, that tells us something about young people and, and you know our expectation of how these things will present. Sometimes you gotta wait to see it. You know, I'm not asking people to be able to look through walls. You know. Um, but if you're mindful about the 
content. For Christ's sake, my grandmother took me to see signs. Now, she was a movie. She was a movie buff. She loved movies. Didn't she? Any, anybody who's a movie buff likes Mel Gibson. Right? Um, so she took me to see signs at a young age. I was scared shitless for four months after watching signs. Those goddamn aliens were invisible. <laughs> they could go invisible when they wanted to. Now, turns out aliens are probably real. So maybe I had good reason to be nervous. <laughs> after all. Uh, but yeah, I was probably too young for signs. Right? That that was within the adult's control. Yeah. And, and we can't overlook or, or try and be naive and dismiss the role that those things can play in a young person's development. You know, because like a, a lot of this hero narrative that we've built up in America, modern society, and it's not really modern. I, when I say modern in that sense, I mean modern post Jesus modern, the last two thousand years. Hero narrative, and it, it's older than that even, but it it, um, it emphasizes how resilient human beings are, but it totally dismisses how fragile we are. Yeah, so there's a real fragility to humans, especially the human mind. The human body is quite good actually, uh, but the human mind not so much. You know, life will just chip away at your sanity at a fast rate, and you'll be able to fake like you're still sane. That's the scary part. Where's the line? <clears throat> you know? So, yeah. Control the content. Control the exposure. Be mindful of it. ask yourself what issues you're dealing with. First. First. And once we clear that hurdle and, and we're, we're in, in a proper accounting of what you're dealing with, now we can start to move on to, to how you're perceiving whatever it is that the, the kids are doing. And one of the biggest issues that I had with this entire psychological domain and, and, and as much of a proponent I, as I am of mental health one of the biggest issues I have is with this ADD, ADHD diagnosis. Big problem with it. First of all, hyper, hyperness, hyper children, is a sign of creativity. It's not to be demonized, and it's surely not to be uh, doused. It's not to be, you know, medicated. You don't want to start medic. You don't want to start medicating. Creativity. That's the that's a, that's that's a canary in the coal mine, you know. So, you know, you have an entire generation, your generation. Really, I'm not singling your generation out. Every generation before the young people that are now that had an unchecked anxiety. They had an unchecked anxiety. We know this because the mental health topic has never been a real priority. If it was a priority. It'd be a priority. It's not. So there's a there's a rampant anxiety, angst in the generation before our current young people. So don't let their attention deficits and their hyperactivity fool you into thinking that it's them and it's not your own irritability from your unchecked anxieties, from your lack of sleep, from your coffee addictions. That coffee addiction is the one I see a lot of. I see a lot of uh, piercing eyes now. <laughs> a lot of eyes looking, looking through me. It's like, um, yeah, coffee. Before we talk about drugs, cocaine and heroin, you know, opioids, marijuana, the alcohol, which I'm always going to show up to talk about the alcohol. That alcohol is a big one. Check that coffee mug. If you need a cup of coffee to be you, you're an addict. Period. Starbucks, Caribou, Hy-Vee, they're not going to tell you that, that, that caffeine works on the brain the same way as cocaine does. I'll tell you. 
I have no dog in the fight. I don't get coffee at all. Barely even chocolate. Caffeine might be the single. And I say that to you because I, I understand that how, how prevalent is coffee with teachers? A lot of the professional world, though, it's not you. There's been 93 billion cups of coffee drank a year in America. 93 billion cups. So, she, she might need some coffee right there. <laughs> Getting tired. Um, yeah, so, like, that, that's what I was saying. You know, check, check in first. Not to say that, that you know, then, then we could, you know, you, you'll, you'll, you'll do this double-edged sword where it's like, well, I'm trying to help the kid, but the, the, the premise is off, right? And, and that's a problem. You know, that's the first problem. Because your help needs to first be genuine in order for there to be a genuine result. And it can't be genuine if there's no honesty with self. Another question. I saw yeah. oh. uh, We talked about religion. We didn't really talk about politics. So gun, gun violence is, yeah. uh, is curing mental health the solution for gun violence. There's no cure to mental health. So, no. No. But I know what you mean. Okay, let's, let's go with a quick answer. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of one side of the gun debate has been to echo and paint the picture that there's a mental health crisis. Strange, because that side of the gun debate has also undermined the mental health system in this country greatly. Categorically, there's no there's no negotiating that. That side of the gun debate has, at every turn, neglected mental health care. That access to care that we talked about earlier, they've been at the helm of that roadblock. So I don't want to hear their mental health is the issue, not the guns. It's bullshit. Now, in their ignorance, what they don't realize is what they're proposing would actually take more guns out of their hands. Because if we went by clinical criteria and we forced people into the vacuum of diagnosis, way more people would be diagnosed than they realize. And therefore, those people would no longer be qualified to have guns. And, and by that standard, people who have guns would then be required to have them taken. Because you're not clinically sane enough to have a gun any longer after we've tested you. Which would, in most cases, probably be right. Would probably be right. And even a step beyond that, what isn't acknowledged in that whole debate is the fragility that we talked about. So you could be sane on Friday. And your wife leaves you on Friday evening, and you may be insane on Saturday. So is there really any, any situation where we can see that guns are safe in, in, in the hands of people in general? But especially of people without a sound understanding of mental health and all the other things that we put in our society. Is, is there really any scenario where we could see that guns are safe in the hands of our present society? I don't think so. From a mental health standpoint. And that's why a lot of the things that you see happening with guns and murder and violence come with the story of, I've never thought that person would do that. Now, half of those people are lying. <laughs> but the other half are telling the truth. That by their experience, I never, never thought John would, would go into the theater and shoot 12 people. That's no way he did that. The guy in Vegas, that's, I never thought he would have done that. Now, I think the people around him are lying. But it is, it is possible for people to hide, you know, those type of characteristics. And it's possible for them to develop them really quickly. So that should scare people. And to go a step further, who it should scare most is the person who has the gun, not the rest of us with what the person with the gun may do. Because the most gun deaths in this country come by way of suicide, not homicide. The suicide death toll by gun is three times the homicide rate. So, yeah, that's that, that, that whole scenario should scare the gun owners more than anybody. But the NRA is, you know, the NRA. Yeah, they won't have me come speak. <laughs> that's all right. We're trying, to, we're trying to work around their votes. Wow. 
Wow. That's, that's the mutation that you will find. That's the... I love that. It's one, of the, it's one of the strangest things I've seen in modern society. Not going to lie. But, you know, all we've talked about people lying, the fragility of the mind, you know, people's different things they have going on, the way they present. The strangest thing I've seen in 28 years is people, uh, young people's ability and interest in other people and watching other people do things. It's like, it's a mutation. That's what happens when you just introduce stuff unchecked with no, with no, you know, with no worry, with no type of, uh, you know, with negligence, you know. Because what we thought was like, okay, so the good things about games are like, at least the kids solve the puzzle, right? Problem solving skills, they're getting something out of it. There's a mental exercise there. You go and play Tetris, you know, you, you learn how to build a little bit. Now, He's not even playing Tetris himself. He's actually watching another kid play Tetris. I mean, that's zombie, that's zombie land right there. And it's just so stupid. Like, you know, there's, you know, at least there's a little bit of fun in, in, in playing it yourself and working it out yourself. And, and, and there's the failing and then there's the you succeeding and, you know, you have that gratification. But it's really hard to justify how a kid gets gratification on watching another kid lose that game. Be shitty at game. Because I, I watch closely and the people that are watching aren't really good at it. <laughs> but you know? Like the commentary, even like some of the commentary is is, you know, like where a person will, will be watching another, another video and you're watching the person watch a video and react to it. Like these guys are idiots. <laughs> so yeah, that's scary. I don't know what's going on there. I got no answers there. That's weird. Don't let your kid do that. <laughs> That's one I'm, I'm clear. No. Don't let your kid watch another kid play a video game. That's bad. I'm sure on that one. Okay. So can we quote you tomorrow when the students talk about it in school? Please. 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 Stop that. At all costs. Yeah. No, it's, it's strange. It, I, I'm, I'm not so far removed from the video game generation. You know, that I don't understand video games and, and, and why people play them. But even my generation is having trouble figure out, figuring out why the young people are doing that. We're looking at them like, what's that? You know, so that tells you how fast technology can, can shift people's minds, like, completely. And we have no, you know, no notice, really, of, of what's going on there. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.